So I don't know if you have your Bibles or devices. If you do, you can turn them. We're going to be in Colossians. We're going to still be in chapter 1. This is our sixth message in this series that we're going through, and we're still in the first chapter. Uh, I promise you the next ones will be a little bit faster, but nothing too, too crazy. So again, if you have your devices, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Colossians chapter 1. So starting off, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but sometimes there are things in life that are easier to show than they are to explain. All right, like take for example, like how would you describe to somebody smell? All right, like if I gave you the fruit, if I gave you an orange, like how would you go up to somebody and say like, this is what an orange smells like? How would you describe that scent to them without giving them the orange? If you couldn't give them the actual orange, how would you describe this is what it smells like? Or if you took them outside and said, like, this is what freshly cut grass is supposed to smell like, but you couldn't take them outside. Like, how would you describe these smells to these people? How do you describe scent without actually just giving them and, like, having them smell it? Or another one, like, how do you describe color? Let's take that same orange. Like, how would you describe the color orange? If you couldn't point to something else that was orange, if you didn't have the orange in front of you, how would you describe orange? If somebody said well, they, were, they were blind, if they could not actually see, how would you describe the color orange? The last one that I can think of here is, and the same idea, let's say somebody is blind. How would you describe turning to the right or to the left? Right, like if I were to the right of this podium, without demonstrating this, without saying this, like, I'm standing to the right of the podium, which is beside the podium, 90 degrees off access, like, I don't know, how do you describe right and left without actually saying, like, it's that way, or it's this way, without showing somebody specifically, like, that's the direction that they're standing in. With all of these things, whether it be your sense of smell and the different things that you can see and smell, or the different things that you can smell, or if we're talking about, again, just the different colors in the world that we have, or again, just in this idea of direction, all of these things make so much more sense when you can actually show them an example. You can say, here it is, there it is, look at that, smell that, whatever it may be. And I start with this because, again, we're still continuing in our series, Christ in Control, where you've been looking at the book of Colossians, and we've been going verse by verse through this entire letter that Paul has written to us. And in this section of chapter 1, in verses 24 through 29, Paul kind of goes into his own example. He's been laying out all these different kind of ideas to us of how he's been praying for this church that he's never met, how he's continued to share the gospel and, and to lead them in ways um, that he, he wishes he could be there in person for. And then he's elaborated into like, like who this Christ person is, of how significant their lives are because of who Christ is. And now he's kind of going into this idea of, well, this person who's so significant, who I've dedicated my life towards, this is my example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so again, one more time, if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 24. And so it reads for us here, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. And so in this first verse, I think Paul illustrates to us this example of of one of suffering. That a Christian life, a life following after Christ, is a life of suffering. I'm going to spend a little bit more time particularly on this point because I think it's, it's the hardest one for us to kind of deal with. It's the hardest one for us to, to fully understand that, that as followers of Christ, that means that our lives are going to be filled with suffering. And that's not always, it's, I don't think it's ever really a positive thing. But here in verse 24, Paul starts off and he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. That bringing the gospel to those around us oftentimes and most often will lead to suffering, especially in today's world and today's society where believing in religion and believing in somebody named Jesus can oftentimes just be offensive. That alone can be offensive to people. Being associated with this person, Jesus, can be reasons that people want to reject you or kick you out or or shun you, whatever it may be. And you may think I'm over-exaggerating, and here in Houston, here in the Bible Belt, it kind of feels that way because we're a little bit more sheltered towards it. But you look towards Hollywood, you take a person like Chris Pratt. We were talking about this in the back a while ago. Again, if you're not familiar with who he is, he is, again, he's been in Parks and Rec, he's been uh, in the Lego movie, and most recently, he's the voice of Mario in the upcoming movie. But Chris Pratt is a Christian, and he is attacked for being a Christian. 
Back in 2020, there was a time where a lot of the, the Marvel superheroes at that moment, they were jumping on board and saying like, hey, we're in support of LGBTQ plus things or whatever it may be. And Chris Pratt didn't say that he was. He didn't say that he hated them. He didn't say he was against them. He just said nothing. Like his other co-stars said, hey, we're all in favor. And he just didn't voice an opinion. And they were like, hey, because you don't support us, you're not attacking us. Just the fact that you don't support us, we're attacking you. Like, they, if you remember, this was kind of that Twitter thread that we're not like, who's the worst Chris? And it was Chris Pratt. They were saying he's the worst one simply because of the fact that he doesn't support things against his own religion. That he believes in the words of who Jesus Christ is. He must be the worst Chris out of the Marvel superhero series. That, in fact, we should kick him out. They didn't want him to be in the movies anymore simply because he believed in a guy named Jesus. It's crazy to think about, but this is the world that we're living in. And this isn't anything of a surprise to us. Again, Paul talks about it here, that he rejoices in his sufferings. But Christ has told us this from the very beginning. In John 15, 18, he said, if the world hates you, know it's because they hated me first. Right? If we're dealing with these sufferings, if we're dealing with persecutions, if we're dealing with things where the world seems like they're against us, it's because they are, because they're against Christ. And so Paul brings this out here and he tells us again that we should rejoice in these sufferings. That he rejoices specifically in these sufferings. And the reason why I think he rejoices is because of what he's pursuing in the end game. And doing research on this and listening and, and just diving into this first, uh, Pastor J.D. Greer, I think he said it really well. He says that the reason why Paul rejoices in the suffering, as he says in this verse, is because you know that you enjoy suffering when you realize that what you get is greater than what you give up. Right? That what you're getting in suffering is greater than what you give up. And ultimately what he's saying is, I enjoy the gospel so much. I enjoy sharing the gospel so much. I enjoy the fact that people can hear the gospel so much that I don't mind the physical abuse that it causes in me. I don't mind the mental abuse that it causes me. And if you look in 2 Corinthians, you can hear this list of all the things that Paul has been done. That the, all these things that have been done to Paul. That he's been beaten, not only by the Jewish people, but also by the Roman people. That he's been imprisoned, that he's been shipwrecked, that he's had all kinds of things happen to him. And he still says, you know what? I rejoice in those sufferings because it's given me the opportunity to share the gospel. And you look at here in our today's society, and we have a lot of mothers to be coming to be. We have my own wife, we, we've had our own baby. If you talk to any mother and you ask them, hey, like that nine months that you were carrying that baby, that, that 24 hours that you went through labor to deliver that baby... Like, was it worth it? Was all that pain, all that agony, all that uncomfortableness, all of that, was it worth it? I guarantee you, every single one of ours will say, yes. And the fact that once, once they hold that baby for the first time, nine months is nothing. All of it that they've gone through is nothing because they now have the thing that's greater than what they gave up. And this is what Paul is bringing us towards here in this first idea. That it's, it doesn't matter all the suffering that he's going through. It doesn't matter all the persecution that he's dealing with. Because what matters most is the gospel that he gets to bring forth to those around him. And then Paul continues in this verse and he brings up this new idea. And he says that he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body of the church. And it's interesting a phrasing that he's choosing here because it kind of begs the question, like, what is lacking in Christ? Like, that seems blasphemous. That's, that seems like what we've been going against a lot of this letter that we've been talking about. Of all the different heresies that Paul has been fighting against, like, it seems like he's saying one himself. He's saying Christ isn't enough. And absolutely, that's not what he's saying. Christ is 100% enough for salvation. But what he's talking about now is the afflictions that he's taking to the rest of the church. What he's talking about here is, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that saves. But that gospel doesn't mean anything if it doesn't go out to the rest of the world. That that's his role in this body that God has placed him in. In this church that God has placed him in. His role is to take this message and bring it forth to the rest of the world. 
There's a story that back in World War I, there's a carrier pigeons were, were one of the major ways that they communicated. And that's because radio frequencies and things like that nature still very much in its early infancies. If you remember those movies, this is where they're carrying those giant backpacks and they're, they're having to roll out the wires all the way through and so forth. And even when you got all that out, like if a mortar hit it or something like that, it was done. Like your whole entire communication could be over just because of some random shot. And so as much as they tried to use radio communication, their primary communication was still through carrier pigeons. And there was one day on October 2nd, 1918, there was a division of American soldiers. They had pushed into forces and were surrounded by German forces at this point. And they were in deep territory with no way out. The worst thing that continued to happen is that their own American troops knew that this was now German territory. So they started firing artillery on their own people, unknowingly, of course. And so these men, they started trying to send out, like, hey, we need to send a carrier pigeon. And all the message said was, we're here, like, stop firing on us. That's all the message was, that's all that they were saying. Like, we're here, please stop killing us. Like, we're your own people. But of course, the Germans know that these methods of communication are being sent out. So every time they released a carrier pigeon, they would shoot it down. And time and time again, they would try here, they would try there, they would try a different day, they would try another day. And every single time, every single carrier pigeon was shot down. So they were down to their last one, which was named Cher Ami, which, if Ani will correct me, in French that means dear friend. And so this last carrier pigeon, they tied the note to it, same note that they've been saying, and they released the pigeon and said, with all of our hope, this is it. This is the last one that we can send. And they watched the bird take off, they watched it fly, and unfortunately, they watched it get shot down once again. <laughs> okay, I don't know about that. I wouldn't cheer for that per se, but um, in, in watching this pigeon get hit, what, I, what crazy enough happened, actually, is that the bird still got back up and it flew again. That even though it was hit in the chest, it got back up and it continued flying. And through the gunfire, it lost a leg, but it still somehow flew 25 miles where the next American base was. And the message was communicated to them that said, we're here, please stop firing on us. They redirected their aim, and through that, they brought home 145 men back to base. 145 lives that would have been lost if not for this carrier pigeon. It was awarded, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was awarded the, the, the highest honors that you can give a bird, basically. And you can still find a museum dedicated to the honor because 145 families now have their husbands, now have their fathers, now have their brothers, their uncles home again because of what this bird did. It didn't matter what the message was. If nobody goes and sends it out, if nobody can hear it, the message doesn't count. And that's what Paul is saying, that he is sacrificing his body. He's doing it because the lack of Christ is not here anymore to carry out the message. And so we are here to do that for him. That that is our role as an example, as a follower of Christ. That we are called to go out and bring this message to the rest of the world. So this is what Paul says is the first example. As a minister, as a follower of Christ, it's to be somebody... Again, who suffers, who, who goes through life, dealing with the sufferings of this world, and knowing that it's worth it for the sake of the gospel. And so Paul continues in verse 25 here, and he says, Of which I've become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery, of, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think the second thing that Paul kind of brings us into, the second example to follow after, is that being a follower of Christ means that you have a life of ministry. That living life in Christ's control is living a life in the service of ministry. See, in verse 25 here, Paul says that he is a minister of the church according to the stewardship from God. And this is one of those words that is very accurately translated, but sometimes the meaning gets lost because of what it means today. The word minister here is diakonos, which can also be translated servant. And I think that, again, that word servant fits better. Because more often than not, when we think of a minister, you think of somebody like me. You think of somebody up here preaching, proclaiming the word. You think of somebody who, who works for the church as their job. But what Paul is saying here is he has become a minister. He's become a servant, really, of the gospel. 
That he has been given that role by God. And ultimately, again, that means that all of us are ministers. All of us are servants of the gospel. That we've all been stewarded to do this from God. And I think this shows even more so because this happened to me just recently. I was hanging out with somebody and they came up to me and they were like, Hey, my, my friend over there, he's atheist. Like, you should go share the gospel with him. And I'm, I'm more than happy to do that, of course. But in my head, I was thinking like, he's your friend though. Like, you should be sharing the gospel with him. Like, this is your role. This is what you've been called to. This is what all of us have been called to. It's not my job to bring the gospel. It's our job to bring the gospel. So when Paul says to us here that he is a minister of the gospel, it's important to remind ourselves again that we are all ministers of this gospel. That we've all been made known. The mystery hidden for ages as he continues in verse 26. This mystery hidden for all the generations but is now revealed to the saints. That we are the saints. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a saint. That prior to Jesus coming down from heaven to earth, we had no idea. That was the mystery. We didn't know exactly how this gospel was going to be portrayed. We had the the Jewish prophecies and all throughout the, the Old Testament that we have. But each person kind of had little bits and pieces here. But nobody had the full story. Nobody fully understood what it all meant until Christ came. It'd be like if we took a giant jigsaw puzzle and I gave each and every one of us a piece of that puzzle. Like, each of us can see something a little bit different. Maybe mine has a picture of somebody's face on it. Maybe I have one that has a little word on it here or there. But just looking at my puzzle piece by itself, I don't know what this ultimately means. I don't know what this puzzle tells me. It's not until you put the whole thing together that we get a full picture of what this puzzle actually means, of what this picture really looks like. And that's what the Old Testament was doing. Each of the different prophets, they each had different pieces of the puzzle But it wasn't until Christ came down that this mystery that was hidden for ages and generations were now revealed. And it's been revealed to us that we have seen, that we have heard of Christ. And we have put our faith in him. And this mystery has been revealed to us and we are now his saints. And Paul continues in verse 27. He says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory. That he wanted us to know the riches and glory of Christ living with us. Of Christ being in control within us. That's the hope and the glory that each of us have. And for those who don't know Christ, then this is a continuous mystery that they still live in. This reminds me of this time where Brittany and I, we were flying back home. And we didn't really quite know what was happening here. Because we, we had gotten onto the plane... And we had situated ourselves. Everybody was ready. And the plane did that thing where like, okay, hey, we're going through all the safety. Like if, you're, if something should happen and the face mask falls down, put it on yourself first and then onto your child. They get through all of that. And so the plane is backing up and it comes back maybe like 20 or 30 feet. And then it just stops. And you hear like different kind of sounds and everything like that. And we're just waiting. They finish the presentation and we're just waiting. And then we're just waiting and we're like, something's kind of weird because usually it doesn't take this long for the plane to take off. And eventually the captain comes on the overhead message and he's like, hey, there's something wrong with the plane and we've been trying to fix it, but we can't. So we're going to have to bring the plane back into docking to fix it. And you hear this giant groan across the entire plane because everybody's like, oh, like we've been waiting here for like 20 minutes and the plane still is taking off. And they're like, then they came on like, hey, if you have a connecting flight, you're going to have to leave to that connecting flight now. Like get off the plane, go get another plane. And you just hear everybody complaining and everybody's so upset about this. And you don't realize that the captain probably just saved all of their lives. Like we don't fully understand all that's happening in this plane. There's this giant Boeing 737 that has so many buttons, so many configurations, so many things that if you were trying to put in control, who knows what would happen. But this captain who recognized that something was wrong and said, instead of trying to fly through this, instead of trying to make your life more convenient, instead of trying to keep to your schedule, I'm choosing to value the lives of everybody here. And we're going to redock this plane and fix the thing that needs to be fixed so that you can go home alive. I think people forget that that there's a mystery that we don't always quite understand. But there are riches and glory that come in this mystery. 
that we don't quite always understand how to explain why the gospel saves. We know how it saves, but we don't know why it convicts people in the way that it does. We don't know why it moves in the way that the Spirit chooses to move in. But that's not for us to understand. That's not the mystery that we need to find out. All we need to know is that that mystery saves. That there is glory and there is hope in that mystery. And that was Paul bringing us to here in the second point. That as we continue in this life as a minister, as we continue in this life bringing forth the gospel, that there are times where we don't understand everything that fits together, but it's still our role and it's still our duty to continue to share that gospel with the world around us. And so finally, Paul concludes here in verses 28 and 29. And he reads for us here, Him being Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I think the last example that Paul gives to us here this morning of how to live a life with Christ in control is that we live a life of proclamation. That we are to fill our lives sharing, declaring, and living out Christ within us. That's what Paul says to us here in verse 28. I think I actually skipped a verse. Oops, verse 28. He says, Him we proclaim. Jesus we proclaim. Again, to proclaim is to make this loud announcement to the rest of the world, to this large crowd. And imagine that if you, you were inside of a building, let's say you're here at this church, and again, this is a made-up situation, I don't want anybody to panic, but let's say somebody on the other side, they notice that there's a fire, and then they come along, and they, they, they don't come along, and they just say like, y'all should probably leave, like there's, it's getting hotter on that side, perhaps you may want to make your way out, just when, whenever convenient, whenever it works for you, whenever you feel like it's right, you may want to exit the building. No, right? They're going to come in here and they're like, hey, like, you need to leave. We need to get out of this place. And I'm, I'd really like to yell, but I don't want to panic people right next door and actually have them leave because I don't want them to actually leave this place. But that would be the, the incentive. That would be the, the tension that we have. Is there is something coming to kill us on the other side. And we're, we need to get out of here. We need to leave this place. We need to proclaim this news to the rest of the world. And it's crazy to think about because there may be a fire over there, hypothetically speaking. And, and there's one that's coming for us. But we're saved by this fire through the, through, the, through the work that Christ has made on the cross. And Paul says that that's what we're to do here. That we're to proclaim, we're to warn, and we're to teach everyone this. And I think of warning and teachings together of how I deal with my daughter Olivia now. That there are times where I see her about to do something that she shouldn't do. That maybe she's found something on the floor that she knows she's not really supposed to eat. Or maybe she doesn't know that she's not supposed to eat it. But she picks up something off the floor. She's bringing it to her mouth. And I'm like, no, like that is not something you want to eat. We have plenty of food for you. That is not one of them. Or maybe she's coming towards something that she shouldn't touch. That it's not really secure to the floor. And she's trying to use it as something to, to lift herself up with or to balance herself. And I catch her because I recognize that that's not something that she can hold on to. And warning her and teaching her in the wisdom that God has given me, that God has raised me in. Again, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to proclaim this truth to the world. That I think proclaiming truth to the world is twofold. It's one, sharing the gospel with those around us. But it's also bringing up those who have heard the gospel into a deeper relationship. To help them mature in Christ, is what Paul says at the end of 28. That I think it's awesome that he includes both sides of this gospel. This, both sides of this great commission that we're called to. That we're called to minister. That we're called to share the gospel. But we're also called to disciple. That we're also called to help raise people up to maturity in who Jesus Christ is. And then finally, the last thing he tells us here in verse 29. Is that this life that's lived is lived in service to God. It's not a part-time service, but it's a full-time one. And he talks about this proclamation that he makes isn't just something that he does when it's convenient. It's not just something that he does when it works out for him. But it's something that he toils and he struggles with all the time. This word struggle, the, the word struggle here, in Greek it's agonosomai. Which again, if you can kind of hear it, this is where we get our word for agonize. So when Paul says that he's struggling with this, when Paul says that he's proclaiming the gospel... When Paul says that he's being a minister, when Paul says that he's raising up people to maturity in Christ, 
He's saying that it isn't just a thing that he does. And again, this is a full-time gospel presentation. It's a working at all costs to see the name of Christ spread across the world. And I think the last thing that encourages us in this is that he says that it's not just on his power alone. That it's not his energy that makes it. But it's the energy that comes powerfully within me from Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, whether you're a coffee drinker or you're an energy drinker, whichever one it is, there's nothing that motivates you more. There's nothing that powers you more than Christ within us. I think the best example that I can think of where this happens for me is there are times, again, once a week, we, we head off to Camp Fusion. It's a youth camp, and it goes from either Monday to Friday or Tuesday to Saturday. It's a five-day event. And for each of those days, we're waking up at 7 a.m., and we're working all the way till 1 or 2 p.m. Like the kids wake up a little later than us. The kids go to sleep a little bit earlier than us. But we're working from 7 a.m. till 1 or 2 p.m. to make sure that everything runs the way that it needs to. And it's not just me. There are dozens of other counselors. There are other uh, rec team members. There are people organizing and helping to see this camp come to fruition. And we're not doing this based on coffee. We're not doing this based on the monsters. Sure, they help, but ultimately it's because of the work that Christ is doing within us, within us that gives us the energy. It's the work that Christ is doing within us that gives us the motivation, that gives us the strength to continue to wake up and go and yell with these kids and celebrate with these kids and encourage these kids and share the gospel with these kids. It's the work of Christ within us, powerfully telling us Powerfully giving us the energy that we need every single day. And so here Paul has given us three examples in three different parts. That we, can, we are to live this life of suffering. That we're to live this life of ministering. And that we're to live this life proclaiming the gospel and the glory of Christ to all the world. For those of you who don't think of yourself as a Christian, for those of you here who are, again, still experimenting, still finding out, is this Jesus person the right one for me? Then, then just take a moment and think about the reason why you're actually here. Like, think about how you got to this place right now. How did you get into this room? Who invited you here? How did you click onto this link? Did the YouTube algorithm magically get you here? Or did God call you sovereignly to listen to something different than everything else that you've been listening to before? More likely, if you're here and you're, you're listening to this, it's because somebody told you about this. Somebody said, hey, there's a church that I belong to. There's a God that I follow, and I'd love to see you join in with this. And whatever words that they decided to use, in some way, shape, or form, somebody came and said, I'd love for you to be a part of this family that I'm of here. Somebody cared enough for you that they wanted you to hear the, this gospel story, and they wanted to put your faith they wanted you to put your faith in the same Jesus that they put their faith in today. That this is the Jesus who stepped down from heaven. Who took the form of a man. So that he could experience all the same things that we do. That he could be hungry. That he could be tired. That he could be sleepy. Also that he could be beaten. He could be mocked and ultimately crucified on the cross for doing absolutely nothing wrong. Jesus did all of this willingly. So that you would have this opportunity that if you put your faith in him, that if you put your trust in him, then you would spend all of eternity with God in heaven. That every opportunity is a moment to worship God. That every wrong that you've done, every time that you've messed up, every time that you've sinned, all of it gets washed away because of the work that Christ did on the cross. Somebody cared enough to invite you to hear that message because they wanted you to be washed and made clean and made righteous before God. And so if you're here, if you're witnessing that, if you've made that decision for the first time, then we'd love to celebrate that with you. We'd love to partner alongside with you. So again, I'll be down here in the front if you'd love to share that new decision you've made. If you're making that online, we'd love for you to connect with us over email. We'd love to celebrate that. And again, just to, to tell you what this life following Christ is going to look like from here on out. And for us who have made this decision, I want to close with this last modern day example of what it means to follow after Christ. And how much, again, we can continue to be this motivating force, this, this action behind the gospel, to continue to bring it forth to the rest of the world. She passed away in 2015, so I don't know, maybe some of you recognize the name, maybe some of you don't. But it's Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. They met in college, and they eventually married in Quinto, and they were trying to share the gospel to the Hornarabi tribe. 
and Jim, along with his four other missionary friends, they were out sharing the gospel. And for whatever reason, we don't fully understand, but the Hanurabi tribe, they killed the men. They killed the four men and Jim. And Elizabeth still returned later on to share the gospel with them, to continue to share of who Christ was. To this tribe of people who killed her husband, who killed her friends. She still continued to say that there is something greater than the sacrifice, than, than the hurt that I'm feeling. There's something greater about the gospel that these people need to hear. So it's one thing for us to decide to dedicate our lives here, but it's another thing for us to live on mission for Christ. It doesn't take away the decision that we make. It doesn't take away the things that have happened. But it puts into perspective the suffering that Paul has gone through, that Jim went through, that Elizabeth went through, all for the sake of sharing the gospel, of making the gospel known throughout the rest of the world. And so will you follow the example left behind by the Elliots? Will you follow the example left behind by Paul? Will you follow the example of Christ who lived the perfect life? My hope and prayer is that you would. That you would follow after these examples and continue to set the example yourself for the next generation to come. For your kids, for your nephews, for your nieces, for the generation after us. That they will speak of our faithfulness to Christ. Of our dedication to the gospel shared to the ends of the world. So with that, let me pray for us here this morning. Father, again, we continue just to thank you just for the work that you've done within us. For the gospel that you've presented before us. And again, just for the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. And so, Father, as we continue through, as we continue looking for ways that we can continue to make you known again, would you just continue to soften our hearts, continue to work within us? Just allow us just to to grow deeper in who it is that you are. To make that decision for the first time, to say, I accept you. I believe in you. I recognize the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and I put my faith in him to take that next step for us. To say that I I love my neighbor enough. I love my coworker enough. I love my classmate enough that I want them to hear this message. That I need them to hear of what Christ has done. So Father, would you continue to, to grow us deeper and allow us just to continue to take our next steps in you. To continue to dive deeper into who it is that you are and who you want us to be. And so, Father, we pray that here this morning, that you would continue to move within us, to shape us, to convict us, and continue to allow us just to praise you. So we thank you, and we do these, and we pray these things, all in Jesus' name. Amen.